Oh, oh, hi. Oh. Hello friends. So today's video is going to be a reading vlog. Apologies if you can hear my dog chewing on a snacky. <laughs> She'll be done in a sec. I haven't done a reading vlog in a while, but two of my most anticipated releases of this year have just come out. And so I thought it'd be fun to bring you along with me as I read through these. First up, we have Hunger of the Gods by John Gwynn. I actually already started this one in a reading sprint that I did for my patrons. So I'm about 100 pages in and I am really enjoying it. I did put this one down just for a bit because it's the kind of story for me that I want to take my time with. This is the sequel to Shadow of the Gods. I'm sure many of you already know that. And if you don't know much about Shadow of the Gods, it's a very Viking-esque inspired fantasy story. We follow three main perspectives, which would be Elvar, Orca, and Varg. Varg is a thrall who is out for justice, we'll say. Elvar is trying to make a name for herself. And then Orca is somebody who she clearly has some kind of past that she has left behind in favor of a peaceful life with her husband and her son, but that's not gonna exactly get the plot moving. So as you would expect, things happen. And I don't wanna say what things happen because that would be spoilery, but things happen that force Orca to look back on her life and uh, analyze how she's gonna live moving forward, we'll say. It's the kind of book where I never at any point loved one character the most throughout and was bored with other characters, it was always that as soon as one character started to take over as a favorite, then something really exciting or really interesting or something to do with the character that made me like them a lot would occur with someone else. And then I'm like, oh, actually, I'm kind of, I'm liking this person. And then it would just keep alternating between the three, which is kind of exactly what you want when you're reading multiple perspectives. I genuinely enjoyed all of their perspectives. And I was very curious because it was a very high stakes, intense ending, what we'd be getting with this sequel and those first 100 pages have been absolutely fantastic so I'm definitely excited to to read more but getting to what I was saying earlier I do think that this is the kind of story that I want to take my time with I don't know if that makes any sense there's certain books that I fly through and I love them and then there's other books that I don't want to fly through because I love them and it's not consistent. I mean, it just depends on the book. So this is one that I think, even though there's a lot of action scenes, a lot of battles, I don't find it particularly fast paced. I kind of just want to sit. And the way I described it to my husband is that I feel like all of the personal things with our characters feel very intimate and small, even though this book is very epic in scope. Not necessarily because you have so many different lands that we're going through or something like that, but just because the lore of it, it just makes it feel very grand, even though, like I said, these characters, we feel very connected to them on a personal level. So anyway, I've been really enjoying this sequel so far, sort of exactly the opposite of what I was saying, where some books I fly through and I end up really liking them was very true of Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse and the sequel Fevered Star just came out. I can't wait to jump into this one. I have not started it just yet, but it's it's here now. <laughs> I'm so excited. I flew through Black Sun. If you don't know, that one is a story following several different perspectives, and one of them very much comes across in a way as a chosen one, but not at all what you would expect, especially because you can't really tell, one, if they even are a chosen one, or if it's more that it's this self-fulfilling prophecy like because maybe they believe they're important you believe they're important but then you're like are they though is this just a lot of nonsense because there's a lot to do with with prophecies that this character sort of believes that they are meant to fulfill but on top of that you don't know if they are good or not even though as a character you kind of like them they seem very kind in a sense and they seem very in just intriguing and they're very just dedicated to what they need to do which contrasts very nicely with another character they interact with who is all about just trying to survive and how these two interact with each other I really enjoyed and then you have a couple of other perspectives that get more into the politics and the culture and those are the two perspectives that I feel like I didn't quite get enough of meaning I'm hoping in this sequel some things are explained and that we see more of that in the second book because there's a lot of things left unanswered in book one. It also had an explosive ending just like Shadow of the Gods did, except for the explosive ending in this one is such a massive 
just it's so abrupt <laughs> it's absolute cliffhanger and so i've been very excited to pick up the sequel i have a book that i'm going to try to finish up within this reading vlog and then get into those other ones and i don't think it will take me basically any time to finish this book because the first book i picked up by this author uh i flew through in basically a day and then now i'm i think around 100 or so pages into the sequel so i'm going to finish that up and then jump into those other books. And the book would be The Bridge Kingdom. So this is the first book. And then The Traitor Queen is the second book. These are very different from the other books that I've mentioned today. The Bridge Kingdom is, it's sort of a political enemies to lovers fantasy romance. And I have been trying to become a little bit better acquainted with fantasy romance. I joke all the time that Final Fantasy X, it's not a joke, I'm very serious, it's the greatest love story ever told, but it's a video game, and I'm like, I need that in book form, please, and it has such a beautiful love story in it, and <laughs> I'm just looking for the book equivalent. I feel like with fantasy, when you do get fantasy romance, it tends to lean very much, and I don't, I don't say this in a negative way, it's just not my personal taste, but it tends to lean very kind of smutty, we'll say. And I'm like, but I want all that fantasy stuff too. I want all the fantasy. I want all of the magic or the creatures or this really intricate, interesting world. I want all those things. And I want characters that I'm like, oh, when are they going to smooch? You know, <laughs> I just want, I want that. And I'm, I've been kind of on the hunt. And recently I read a book that, um, it didn't quite fit that, that it was a game of fate. And I will have my video for that linked because it was, a very funny book, but not exactly what I was looking for. And so I decided to pick up The Traitor Queen. It's not brand new. It's been out for a little bit. And I was like, this is more along the lines of what I've been on the hunt for. So for those of you that have read uh, The Bridge Kingdom and The Traitor Queen, let me know what books you think are similar to the amount of fantasy and romance you get. So for those of you that are interested in picking this up, you've never heard about it, I was really surprised at just how much the author really spent time crafting the politics and the economy of this particular land and the struggle of trying to maintain peace with one place, but maintaining peace with this place then costs you an alliance with someone over here. And so if you try to fix things over here, then that kingdom is going to be upset, feeling like you're betraying them, you're going against the alliance with them because this other kingdom over here is also enemies with them. So there's a lot to it with that, which I'm all about, I love the politics and fantasy, and it's enemies to lovers because right when the story starts, we follow a girl named Lara, and she is basically been trained her whole life to fulfill a marriage alliance with the Bridge Kingdom, and in doing so, she is supposed to figure out all of their secrets, figure out everything that makes them essentially unconquerable, impenetrable, because they do have this bridge that is very important to their economy, but nobody has ever really been able to capture them. It's this series of islands and they're very hard to take control of. And so her job is to figure out all this information and report back to her father so that he can then take control of this country. But while she's there, she's starting to learn more about this country. She's starting to see that maybe some of the things she's been taught are not exactly true. And then you also get the perspective of the leader of this country, who is now her husband. And you can see where the enemies aspect of the story is. And I thought the buildup with their relationship was done really well. I really enjoyed it. It wasn't like this instantaneous, like, oh my gosh, I just suddenly, all of the things I've ever been taught, I'm going to forget because this guy is hot. It wasn't like that at all. And then he is very suspicious of her. And I just really liked the way their relationship built. Like I said, I liked all the details involving the politics. And then now I'm reading uh, the sequel and I should be done with it very soon. So I'm really enjoying this duology. I saw that the author has more books technically in this series, but I think they follow different characters. I don't want to look too into it because I'm afraid of <laughs> being spoiled, but I believe that these two books follow these characters and the other ones follow other characters. So anyway, like I said, let me know if you have recommendations that you feel are similar to these because I've been quite liking them. Are you sleepy girl? Are you sleepy girl? <laughs> yeah? Okay. What, Luna? <laughs> oh, you're so cute. Getting ready to do a reading sprint with some patrons. <coughs> oh. Planning on
on starting Fever to Star during the sprint. So we'll see how that goes. Someone is pouting. <laughs> Hi, Luna. Are you pouting? <laughs> a little update on my reading thus far. So I've read a decent amount of Fevered Star. Black Sun had such an explosive ending, but also it's one of those cliffhangers that I think a lot of people really get frustrated by because it's so abrupt. And so going into this second one, I almost felt like it was so much chaos at the end of book one that I needed a sec to take everything in that had just happened, and that's exactly what we've been getting so far with Fevered Star. We also get a very, not quite as intense opening as Black Sun had, but I still feel like the opening to this one is also very much one of those dun-dun-dun kind of openings was a great way to explain it. But one of those openings that just initially pulls you in, it very quickly catches your attention and it sets up the stakes because there are people, there are things at play that you don't understand but seem very powerful. They seem like they can wield a lot against other people and you don't know if they can do that for good or if they even want to do it for good. So I think the very opening was very gripping. And then from there, we got that sort of let's slow down, let's figure out what happened. But on top of that, we've very quickly started seeing the perspectives that we had in book one. And while we're taking time to digest everything, I also think that things are moving along and the plot is starting to go forward. I did end up finishing this duology. The Traitor Queen is the second one and I really liked it. Sorry, the little little thing is a uh, noisy. So I'm just going to hold up the first one, but I ended up really enjoying this. It was basically everything I'd been hoping for when it comes to a fantasy romance. I really liked the pace of the relationship building, but on top of that, kind of what I was saying at the beginning of the video, I was so surprised with by just how much attention to detail the author put into crafting their country, into crafting the problems between one country and the next by diving into the economy. I do think if you're somebody who likes your fantasy romance to lean a lot more on the romance side, the romance is obviously there. It's obviously very important to the plot. However, I don't think that you're going to get quite as much of the relationship stuff as you might want. Maybe not as much of the spice as you might want. There's not as much of that as maybe some of you are craving. For me, it was fine because <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I like fantasy that has great characters. I like fantasy where the arcs for the characters is done really well. And if on top of that, there are multiple characters that have that going on and they come together, then you see them challenging each other, you see them working together, you see them butting heads. I think that, I think that's great. That's one of the things I really like. And it doesn't even always have to be romantic. It can be between friends. It can be between siblings. In this particular story, it happened to be romantic. Going back to our new releases here, Fevered Star, like I said, I'm going to try to finish hopefully, hopefully within the next day or two, and then jump back into Hunger of the Gods. Where's your bear, Luna? Where's your bear? Where is it? Where's your bear? That's right, good job. Good job, you want a snacky? Okay, come on. <laughs> Where are they? Where are the snackies? Maybe in that cupboard? Hey, Luna. Stay. Go. <laughs> now you gotta go to your spot. <laughs> Good job, Luna Bear. Luna, I know you're just standing right outside. Luna. <laughs> Luna Bear. Hi. <laughs> Luna, do you want a snacky? Luna. Do you want a snacky? Oh, that you'll come in for. <laughs> 
I have now finished both Fevered Star and Hunger of the Gods. For both of these, I enjoyed the first books more. I would say this one especially so. Black Sun to me, I just absolutely flew through that book. I found it so engaging and I was excited to come back to this world and learn more about this world. But I almost feel like my favorite characters sort of came second to the setting up of book three. So put simply, it essentially had middle book syndrome a little bit for me. We definitely, in the first chunk, are handling the repercussions of that explosive ending, which I didn't mind at all. I actually felt like I needed time to process that ending and a little bit be reminded of things that had happened. That's kind of what you expect in a lot of sequels. You're reminded of previous events. And with that one, that one's hard to forget, but it's nice to be sort of placed back in the world and know who's who and what's what, which if you pick up Fevered Star, you might want to refresh yourself on Black Sun if you haven't read it in a while, because Rebecca Roanhorse does not really hold your hand when it comes to all of the different groups of people and all of their various different motivations, which play a huge role. And on top of that, our characters, their agency is sort of stripped away in this book, or at least my two favorite characters to follow. Those two characters, they sort of just end up in the background while other things come to the forefront. There's one character in particular who I would say was very filled with a big personality in book one, and this character, that personality felt very much dampened, and it seemed as if they were constantly just observing things in this one, and I kept waiting for that character to get their gusto back, and I didn't really feel like they did. <laughs> and then the other character, I understood why they were maybe not as able to stay focused on a particular thing, as a particular goal, because they absolutely had a goal in mind for that whole first book. And then after that first book, you're now looking at what comes after, and this character's a little bit lost. And there were moments I felt for this character so much because I just wanted somebody to give them a hug. I wanted somebody to be like, I'm here for you. And I just wanted somebody to be their friend. And you don't, it's just sad because you can see that they want that too. It's not just me that wants it for them. You can see that they want it. And so they're kind of in this battle of having dedicated their whole life to something and then not really receiving what they would have expected. It's actually a really heartbreaking theme that I think a lot of people can relate to. So many of us, even if it's less obvious. There are so many aspects of our lives where we give so much to something or to someone only for it to never really come into fruition or to never have anything gained from it or never have the respect or the love or whatever it may be. And I think that's something that's very relatable. However, I do feel like those moments were somewhat few and far between. They popped up and they were impactful, but I guess I wanted to spend more time seeing that character face that struggle. <laughs> it sounds really terrible, like, can they struggle for longer? But I just, I wanted a little bit more. I feel like that character was barely in the book. And then we do have one character who is less prominent in book one, who sort of becomes more of a focus in this one. And I did find their plotline interesting, though I do wish that some of the characters surrounding them had been a little bit more fleshed out. Uh, I'm gonna really quick give specific names to these characters. So this is not really spoilery because I'm not spoiling plot points, but for those of you who, who are wondering like who's who, I wanna say that really quick, so I'm gonna have a timestamp. But with the characters I was just mentioning, Giala is the one who I felt her awesome fierceness was somewhat absent in this one, and that was a little bit of a bummer. And then with Serapio, he's the one that's experiencing this, he gave so much, and now we're looking at okay, well, n is anybody even loyal to me? Because I've been loyal to this cause for so long. Narampa is the one that I would say became more interesting, but I do wish that her brother's plotline and all the people that end up surrounding her and surrounding him, I wish they had been a little bit more significant as far as page count goes or just the amount of time dedicated to getting to know them. Really quick, before jumping into Hunger of the Gods, I do want to add that I by the end, I'm very interested in picking up book three. I think where everybody is placed and everything that has been set up is, it's setting up something that I think is gonna be very exciting. However, I do think the means of getting there, it just wasn't my favorite. I felt like we maybe almost could have gotten certain places faster. And to some degree, I wish certain things had just occurred in book one 
or certain plot lines had been... I almost feel like certain plot lines I wish had progressed quicker, while other ones I wish had had more time. So I think it's somewhat of a pacing issue for me personally. But again, still definitely really excited now that we do have everybody in position. I'm excited to see what happens in book three. And then with Hunger of the Gods, I do think I enjoyed book one a little bit more overall, but not because this book, it's not like I thought it dropped in quality or anything like that. It more so had to do with the plot lines of the characters. So in the first book, we have three perspectives. This one we do open up and then have five perspectives, and I really enjoy the addition of those. But getting back to our main three in the first book, we have one character who clearly has a shadow of a past. There's something that happened in their previous uh, years, but now they are trying to live out a peaceful life, but then something disrupts that, and now they are searching for someone. We have another character who is seeking revenge, and then we have somebody who is trying to make a name for themselves. And in this book, one character is continuing to search for someone, and then another character who wants revenge, they still want revenge, but one of the characters that they are aligned with, that person's now searching for someone. So in a sense, it's like secondhand searching because <laughs> they're tagging along trying to find someone. So you ended up having two plot lines that were just people looking for people. And then the other character, I did like the progression of them continuing to try and elevate themselves. But I do think that some of what I really found satisfying, I could have used more of. And it had to do with their family ties. So this particular character has some people that don't really expect much of them, and I almost wanted to see more of that. There's some pretty satisfying moments with where the character ends up and how much they have to push through, and so I really liked when we did get the satisfying moment. I just kind of wish we had more of them having, of them getting to prove people wrong, because I really enjoyed that. And I liked Overall, I still really enjoyed the world. I There was one part that the way that that John Gwynn tied in actual mythology and certain stories was really cool. It has to do with how the gods have treated one of the other gods and the story that's similar to, I believe, Loki and some things that were done to Loki. And I was like, hey, I know that. It's just fun to see those nods to those mythologies put in this while still making it their own. I thought that was really cool. And the action is continuing to be really exciting. There was one scene that I wish had lasted actually a little longer and I'm usually pretty picky with my action and I'm like, all right, let's get going with this <laughs> unless it's a really big moment. But there was one scene that I felt the opposite that I typically do, which is that there's one character who kind of has this face off with another character and they're both vying for power. And it happened pretty quick and I was, I was like, oh, I was all pumped up for this and then it was kind of over really fast, but that's okay. I do continue to find myself really gripped by this world. And then with the addition of these two other perspectives, I really enjoyed them. One in particular, they, you don't really see them as villainous in the first book. And then in this book, after some events from book one, I feel like you're inclined to view, to view them as a villain, but I personally never did. And the reason being, I can understand why they feel the way they do and why they have the motivations they have. So that character to me might have been the most interesting, the most layered to me. I found everything they were doing, I, I wish I had more of them and I wish there'd been a little bit more going on with their plot line because I just found them, I was so gripped by them because there's this sort of moral conundrum that you have as the reader because you sort of have an attachment to the characters from book one and this character ends up being an enemy, but I don't really feel negatively towards them even though they get in the way of another character. And I just think that's an example of, uh, of John Gwynn doing a really good job writing gray morality, right? Because whenever you have a character that is technically the bad guy, but you don't really know, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'm rooting for them over the other person necessarily. It's more just, I have an attachment to this person, but now I'm kind of like, oh, but I get it. I get why they're feeling that way. And that is not true of the last perspective. The last perspective is the sniveling, easy to dislike character. And I really enjoyed being in their head. And I want to shout out my friend Petrick. He absolutely nailed it. I thought this too, but I also want to just, I don't know, 
send people Patrick's way because he's amazing. So I'll have his channel linked. And he has fantastic written reviews on Goodreads. But he talked about how he felt like this one particular character that got a perspective in this book very much reminded him of how Joe Abercrombie approaches Glockta from First Law. And I would agree very much with that. That sort of disconnect between Glockta's thoughts versus what come out of his mouth. I would say that this character, it was a very similar thing. In their mind, they're constantly raging at everybody. They're constantly looking down at everyone. They're constantly elevating their own worth. But then out loud, they're groveling at people's feet and they're betraying everybody left and right. And so I really enjoyed seeing that. I have to say though, there were certain times, and this is this is part of why I think a lot of us like Lockta too. There's the occasional moment where it's kind of funny and you're like, oh, Am I like that? <laughs> because I feel like part of being a human is learning to filter what comes out of your mouth, but sometimes your thoughts are somewhat negative. And then I'm like, oh, am I just, am I a sniveling villain? Anyway, I just really enjoyed seeing how he approached this character. And I thought the additional character perspectives were fantastic. Now, I am very much looking forward to book three because the very end, I was like, wait a sec. <laughs> and if you've read it, you know, I'm pretty sure what I'm referring to, because I'm like, did that really just happen? I can't tell. I feel like maybe it didn't. I mean, it did, but I'm also like, is it as severe as I think it is? So I don't know, and I don't want it to be. But also, I will have to wait till book three comes out to find out for sure. And then there's another character that just, I kind of hinted at it before they had the most satisfying conclusion to their arc. I was like, yes. For this end chunk talking about Hunger of the Gods, I also am going to do what I did with Fevered Star, and I'm actually going to start using character names uh, for those of you that have read for the first book and you kind of want to know a little bit more of who's who and what's what. So the last thing I'll mention is with the character Varg, I think that perspective has the most fleshed out side characters. And funny enough, I thought Varg, his own personal agency, came second to the person that leads this group, and therefore he wasn't as as relevant in his own perspective, but I still feel like them as a unit is the strongest. And it makes sense because it's the blood sworn and they're kind of known for that. And so it's reflected in how it's written where you feel that camaraderie and that bond. And then with Orca, I mean, she's kind of just doing what she's got to do. She doesn't really, she's constantly actually pushing people away. So it makes sense that the relationships are not going to be there as much. It makes sense you're not going to get to know those characters as much. But I do a little bit miss that from Varg's perspective. I wish that was in hers as well. Then with Elvar, I personally think that I want to see a little bit more of what we see with Varg and the Bloodsworn with her group. Because with Orca, it makes sense that there would be distance. With Elvar, I would think that they would be a little bit more close-knit than, than I end up seeing. And so I'm kind of hoping after everything that happened in this one, we do see that a little bit more. And I also understand because Elvar is progressing. So there is going to be that, you know, I can't be everybody's friend sort of thing, except for on a really extreme level. I get that, but I do just a tiny bit wish there is a little bit more of the friendship factor tied in with with them. But let me know your thoughts on these if you've picked them up. If you do want to talk spoilers because they're sequels, just remember to write spoilers in your comments and then enter so that nobody who happens to come across it and hasn't picked it up yet is ruined. But anyway, thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see you all later. Bye. Action!